Please get seated. So I'm Francis Bach, the this year's ICMA General Chair. It is my great pleasure uh, to welcome our second uh, joint invited speaker. So George Tenenbaum is a professor in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT. He is one of the thought leaders of our community, and he has been working at the interface between uh, machine learning and cognitive science with the striking ability of, of having great contributions in the two disciplines, as shown by the many awards he has re have received. Also, he has been mentoring a lot of, of uh, PhD students and, and postdocs, and many of, of them are now leaders in our uh, disciplines. So please, uh, uh, oh, today he's going to talk about like building machines that learn and think like people. So please uh, give a warm welcome to George Tenenbaum. Okay, um, thanks for that introduction. Wonderfully generous introduction, and thank you to the organizers for this great opportunity to be here, and also to the last speaker. I think you're going to see a number of common themes in the talk I am gonna give. It's I'm coming from a complementary perspective as a cognitive scientist, a member of brain and cognitive sciences, but also an AI researcher. Um, but you're going to see, I think, again, um, it's, it's interesting, if you, I, I think one way to put it is if you try to come up with talks that connect these three different communities, um, maybe it's inevitable what we'll come to. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna be talking about building machines that learn and think like people. And in particular, I'm gonna be talking about research that we've been doing at MIT and with a number of other colleagues and other institutions in the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines and also as part of this new institute-wide initiative at MIT that we call the Quest for Intelligence. I'm going to be talking about the work of a number of current students and postdocs, as well as some alums and faculty colleagues. I tried to list most of the key people here. Um, if I forgot your name, I'm sorry. I'm going to try to, um, it's a lot of work here, and I'm going to try to single out, as we go along, the really key project leaders. And I just have to say, I've been incredibly lucky to work with all of these people on what, to me, are the, really the most exciting questions we could be thinking about. It's an amazing time to be asking these kinds of questions in between the cognitive sciences and engineering because we have all around us AI technologies, right? But in a very real sense, we don't have any real AI. What I mean by that is that we have machines that do things that we used to think only humans could do, and they do them very well. Sometimes they beat the world's best. But none of these machines has anything like the flexible general purpose common sense that each of you use to learn to do each and every one of these things if you choose to and an infinite number of other tasks that you could learn. So what's missing? What's the gap? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Okay. Now there's many things that are missing and it's a long way away before we have anything like that, that level of general purpose AI. But the, the particular gap that I've been focusing on is summed up in this slide. What, what is the uh, really distinguishing feature of recent AI technologies, of course, as everybody here knows, is the recent successes in pattern recognition. That includes, of course, deep learning, but other data-driven machine learning methods that have really just nailed this problem. But intelligence is so much more than pattern recognition. In particular, it's about modeling the world. So that means not just finding patterns in data, but actually explaining and understanding what we see. It means being able to imagine things that we haven't seen yet, maybe that nobody's ever seen. And then to make plans and solve problems to make those things real. And then to be able to build new models as we experience more about the world, so learning as model building. If you're interested in these themes, I'd refer you to this article that came out in Behavioral and Brain Sciences last year with a number of excellent commentaries and some responses uh, that I wrote together with several former students and postdocs and colleagues, uh, Brendan Lake, Tomer Ullman, Sam Gershman. We explore these issues at great length, probably too much length, but um, if you want more than this talk, start there. Okay. I think we have to admit, right, that we are very far from being able to capture human model building at anything like the kind of level of engineering maturity and scale that Silicon Valley would like. And yet, what I want to tell you about here is I think there is at least one route to try to get there, which is to reverse engineer how these abilities work in the human mind and brain. And this is the fundamental principle of our Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines, and the part of the quest for intelligence at MIT that I've been working on. That the basic science of how intelligence arises in the human mind and brain can lead to fundamental advances in the engineering of intelligence if we approach our science like engineers. 
So here's our quest grand challenge. Imagine if we could build a machine that actually grows into intelligence the way a person does, that starts like a baby and learns like a child. I've been working on this project with a number of colleagues at MIT and beyond. Here I'm just showing you three of them, Laura Schultz, Rebecca Sachs, and Elizabeth Spelke. And together, we're, this is what we're trying to tackle. We think that success would mean artificial intelligence that is in some sense truly intelligent, and machine learning that actually learns. Okay? And, and it's a long way away, but that's okay because we know that even small steps towards this goal can be huge. So consider the history of deep learning and reinforcement learning. Just here's a few snapshots. Some of the original papers were the basic mathematics of these world-changing algorithms were first published. I just want to draw your attention to when and where they were published. They were published decades ago, in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s for the most part, in, in journals of psychology, or computational neuroscience, or general science journals like Nature. Pub these, these were papers written by, some of them were by mathematicians, physicists, psychologists, engineers. In each case, they, these are small steps, just trying to give some basic mathematics of some of the simplest learning processes in animals. Think Pavlov's dogs. But what we've seen is that these small steps, when engineered at scale, can change the world. So think what we could do with the next small steps, especially if these were small steps about actually trying to understand how human children learn. Now, this is probably the oldest idea in AI. Um, it was, um, um, in, among other things, introduced here in Alan Turing's famous paper, where he also introduced the Turing test. This paper, published in 1950, uh, well preceded all of these other papers I showed you there. And it's been championed by many others for good reason, right? Human children are the only actual known scaling route to human-level AI in the known universe. They're the only system we know that reliably, reproducibly, demonstrably grows into a human intelligence, starting from something less than that. So if we could en engineer that or understand how that works in engineering terms, well, what other route would we need? Now, of course, we all have to ask, if it's such a good idea, why hasn't it worked yet? <laughs> and I think, to be honest there, we have to say that it's really only now that, that the, all the relevant fields are, I think, mature enough to talk to each other. In particular, I think it's only now that the science of how children actually learn, the science of cognitive development, as, as represented by some of those colleagues of mine that I showed you there, and many others, is at the point of maturity that can offer real engineering guidance to AI, and hopefully AI is at a point of maturity where it can take that guidance. And it's really needed, I think. Um, the basic questions that we have to address, right, what are the engineering questions if we want to do this is, what is the starting state, how do babies actually start, and what are the actual learning mechanisms of children? And you could be incredibly brilliant, like Turing, but unless you study the science, all you can do is presume how these work. And Turing, as brilliant as he was, presumed wrong, and he was quite honest about it, he didn't know, right? So to just highlight a line from his famous paper, presumably, the child brain starts out something like a notebook as one buys it from the stationers, rather little mechanism and lots of blank sheets. But what we now know is that's just completely wrong, basically. <laughs> so again, in, echoing very much of the previous speaker. So for example, in the classic work of Elizabeth Spelke, she showed by studying babies as young as two months, three months and older, that children don't just initially see the world, the youngest babies, as just patterns and pixels, even high-level convnet features, but rather in terms of objects. That means physical objects in the three-dimensional world, objects that don't wink in and out of existence or teleport or pass through walls. Okay? In a very real sense, they are already born prepared with object permanence and knowing about three-dimensional space. Rebecca Sachs has studied similar things as well as the basic social cognitive mechanisms, the way babies understand other people. And she's shown in recent work, this was from a recent paper um, uh, based on functional magnetic resonance imaging of four to six month old infants, that the high level functionally specific brain circuits that we see in adults for say understanding other people and other parts of high level perception in large, in large forms are basically already there as early as you can look in babies' brains. And Laura Schultz, who studies the learning of older children in what's often known as the child of scientist view. So for example, uh, very much developed and popularized by Alison Gopnik or Susan Carey and others who study children's learning. They study all the ways in which children's learning is, is nothing like just copying things down from the blackboard, but an active process of forming theories about the world and doing experiments, the experiments that we call play, in order to test those hypotheses actively. So in other words, what we've learned is that the starting state is rather more sophisticated than we might have thought. And the learning procedures are also rather more sophisticated than we might have thought. We have 
supervised learning and reinforcement learning, but we also have these much more powerful mechanisms in humans. And that raises the challenge for engineering or reverse engineering. How are we going to capture those in machine terms? So that's what I'm working on. And I'm focusing on intuitive physics and intuitive psychology. I'll illustrate what I mean in a second. But again, very resonant with, I think, what you saw in the previous talk. Because while I'm not really going to be talking about natural language here, these abilities are also, among other things, the building blocks for our first words and our first phrases, and then that, the window that all that gives us into the rest of the world of human meaning. A key stage here, again resonant with the previous talk, is the stage of 18-month-olds. So consider this 18-month-old here on the left who's um, stacking up cups, um, a popular kid activity, all right? And think about the intuitive physics that lets him do that, that lets him assemble these cups into a tower, that lets him make a plan where he's, after failing to fit that one cup on, he's gonna make a, a sub-stack of two cups and put it on the three. Okay. And then to debug that plan at multiple levels when it might go wrong. Now, for those of you who, who work on robots, or everybody else here because you're sophisticated uh, consumers of robotics, all right, um, we know this is far beyond what today's robots could do. And if we could build robots that had that level of the ability to think about, let alone manipulate the physical world in their plans, then that would be amazing. Or when we talk about intuitive psychology, here I'm going to show this famous video again of Felix Wernicke and Michael Tomasello, another 18-month-old. And what you'll see here, the subject of, of an experiment. Now, this is a, a famous experiment where there's that kid in the back, the one-and-a-half-year-old, okay? And he's seeing, just like you, an action that he's never seen before. And you haven't seen this before either unless you've watched this video, okay? But just like you, he can understand what's going on and how to interact, right? Just watch here. It's amazing, right? So think about the common sense that has to be going on inside that kid's head to be able to do that, all right? Again, there's intuitive physics to understand the action, what, you, what are the constraints, but then there's the goals and the plans, there's the joint attention, the eye contact, the quick look down at the end to the, to the person's hands to make an inference about how the plan's gonna be complete. If we could build robots that could do that, you know, that would be incredible, okay? So again, far away, but that's where we're trying to get to. Now, in the work that I'm going to be talking about here, I'm going to tell you about some of the first steps we're doing and the basic kind of technical tools. This isn't going to be a very technical talk, but again, I'll try to include pointers to the more technical work. Um, but just to highlight some of the tools, one is the idea of probabilistic programs. Okay? These are a new generation of AI programming languages. Um, and like um, you know, I'd, I'd say most of the rest of AI, uh, having the right programming language is by no means sufficient to make progress, but it is often necessary or extremely valuable. So think about how much TensorFlow or Torch or PyTorch have contributed to deep learning. So uh, the term probabilistic programming means different things to different people, but this is what it means to me. Um, it has about as much to do with probability as neural networks have to do with neurons. Namely, it comes out of trying to think about some basic issues in um, probabilistic modeling and how to build general tools that capture what is essential to probabilistic models. But at this point, it's expanded to include programming languages which really allow us to combine a number of the best ideas in AI from multiple generations of of uh, trends in the field. So not just, of course, the most recent developments in neural networks, but also the ideas of probabilistic inference in graphical models, especially causally structured models, and even before that, the idea of symbolic languages. These tools, the tools for abstract reasoning and composition that you have in symbolic languages, and the tools for reasoning under uncertainty, for grasping causal structure, and then in hierarchical probabilistic models for being able to uh, learn flexible inductive biases and learn to learn, combined with advances in neural networks and deep learning for pattern recognition, are incredibly powerful when, when they come together. And I think if there's any technical message to take from this talk, it's that we, we shouldn't have to, and really we must not feel forced to choose between the, the power and advantages of these ideas, but rather develop frameworks that allow us to combine their strengths. And at this point, there's a number of exciting probabilistic programming languages. Uh, for example, recently the Pyro language being developed by Noah Goodman and colleagues at Uber AI, um, or uh, languages like ProbTorch, BayesFlow, you might recognize um, names. Um, Gen is a language being developed by Vakash Mansinga and colleagues at MIT. And all of these languages have the, the same goal to integrate these excellent ideas. Now, it's not enough just to have 
you know, an, a general purpose programming language, you have to say what kind of programs are you going to write. And for us, the way we're trying to capture the basic common sense knowledge of young infants is with probabilistic programs that are built on a core of game engine programs. So the tools that game engine designers use to create a rich, uh, or the, uh, the, the game engines provide to game designers to allow them to create many rich immersive experiences, many new games, without having to program everything from scratch, but that give you fast real-time interactive graphics or fast real-time interactive physics, none of which you know, is perfect. In fact, it doesn't have to be right. It just has to look good on short time scales and be, and be efficient enough to interact with in real time with the user. Those, we think, are the same kinds of engineering considerations that, that shaped the human brain and other animals' brains over evolution. And we think that to a first approximation, the tools of game engines can, can describe in some way Okay. Not too literally, but in some way, what evolution has given us as far as these common sense modeling abilities. Okay. That also extends to what you might call simple kinds of game AI, or tools for allowing non-player characters to interact with the player by having some kinds of perception and planning abilities. So, you know, I think many people at this point in AI and robotics and machine learning use game engines to generate training data for machine learning methods, right? But our suggestion here is that there's a game engine in your head, that these tools are not just a way to make a simulated world, but to capture the way your minds simulate the actual world. By wrapping these, these uh, game engine programs inside probabilistic inference frameworks, that's how we're going to try to reverse engineer these capacities here. Okay. Um, another way to put it is if you want to understand the arrows on this diagram, you could interpret this, for example, this intuitive physics sketch over here is something like a hidden Markov model. But there's no way you could capture it with the standard tools of hidden Markov models, fixed finite dimensional state vectors or transition matrices or observation matrices. Rather, we use the tools of game graphics and physics engines to make these thick arrows have the right kinds of abstract properties to capture the real causal structure of how uh, graphics and vision and physics works. So for the rest of the talk, I want to show you how we're using these tools to try to answer these two questions. First, how do these systems work, and then how are they learned? Okay. Um, you know, for, a, for a talk at ICML, there's only going to be some learning here, but I think it's important to understand what is learned before we can talk about how to learn it or how to learn with it. So let's talk about intuitive physics, for example. So in work going back a few years that really started in our group with Pete Battaglia and Jess Hamrick, who are now both at DeepMind, um, we published a paper about five years ago in PNAS uh, uh, with the, with the, the well, the, the, for us, the informal title was the Intuitive Physics Engine. It had a somewhat different name, something like Simulation as an Engine of Physical Scene Understanding. But what we tried to do there was to show how we could take simple kinds of game physics engines, wrap them in a framework for probabilistic inference to answer many, many different kinds of questions of intuitive physics. Like, for example, when you see these stack of blocks, some of them look like they should be falling, others of them look stable, some you can't tell, and we might ask people to just judge on a scale of one to seven how likely any one of these towers is to fall. That's what you see the average judgment of a group of participants is on the y-axis. And then we ask our game engine the same thing. Now there's some uncertainty in both humans and in our model. Our model's uncertainty comes from the fact that we can't perfectly estimate the 3D state from an image. And then we might also be uncertain about exactly which forces are in play. There's gravity, there's friction, there's collisions, but there could be, you know, the table could be bumped or there could be a wind. And the combination of those things allows this model to make very good quantitative predictions of people's judgments. So the model's predictions, the average of a few posterior samples in the game engine are shown on the x-axis. And in the paper, we use the very same model to answer questions not just about will the stack of blocks fall, but which way might they fall or how far will they fall? Or to, here's a little bit of language, I would say. Suppose I tell you that um, the gray stuff is 10 times heavier than the green stuff. So I can just tell you that in words. And there's a language interface to your game engine program. So you can set the mass or the density of one material. And then that's going to change how you make predictions. So here you see, for example, two geometrically identical towers. But because they're colored differently, and if you know that the gray stuff is 10 times heavier, you'll think one will fall one way and the other will fall the other way. And both people and the model make similar predictions. Or you might make inferences backwards. So in the, if these scenes, which might look to you surprisingly stable, if I say, well, maybe the red stuff or the yellow stuff is a lot heavier than the other, can you tell from looking at these which one is it? So the same models can do that too. Let me just show you one of the more unusual kinds of inferences that we studied in this paper because it shows you how 
having these kinds of probabilistic simulation tools allow you to answer questions not just like, will the stack fall, which again, we've all had lots of experience with and maybe could use a pattern recognition approach for, but a question that unless you've seen me give this talk before or read the paper, you've probably never thought about. So here's a task. I'm going to give you this task not through a data set but through English. Okay? Um, and the question is this. What if this table is bumped hard enough to knock some of the blocks onto the floor? Is it more likely to be red or yellow blocks? So let's make this interactive. So you guys tell me. Red or yellow? OK, red. You got you to gotta be loud so I can hear you in this big room. OK. How about here? Here. One more. OK, all right, you all got to experience the joys of experimental psychology. <laughs> um, and what you, see, what you saw happen here, if you could hear what everyone was saying, was the same kind of things we observe in the lab. So sometimes you're sure what the answer is. And everybody responded quickly and, and loudly with the same answer. Other times there's uncertainty across people, or sometimes that, or that uncertainty also shows up in response latency. You're a little bit longer to answer when you're not sure. So what's going on inside your head to be able to answer that? Well, we capture this with the same kind of model that I just showed you, and we can get basically about the same quantitative accuracy on this task as we did on the much more familiar task of how likely is this stack of Jenga blocks to fall. And the way we capture it is by doing something like this. Here's a little window into one of these simulations. Uh, let's see if I can click this thing here. So here I'm just showing you a small bump of the table in our game engine. And here's a big bump. Now notice, of course, that um, at the micro level of all the individual blocks, different things happen each time. But at the level that matters for intuitive physics, for the judgments I'm asking you, exactly the same thing happened. Namely, all the yellow blocks went over and few or, or none of the red blocks. And also note that to answer this question, you don't have to run the simulation for very many time steps. So even just a, sh a few time steps, so I wanted to stop it there. Even just a few time steps, like that, or here, even just a a few time steps, that's enough to answer the question to make a reasonable guess. And it doesn't have to be a very high fidelity simulation, and it, there's no way that you're going to run a high fidelity simulation for this highly nonlinear system over more than a few time steps. But just a few low fidelity samples are enough, maybe even just one, to make a reasonable guess. So that's the basis of this system. And it's built without any learning at all. Not, I'm not saying that, that there isn't learning involved in building it in a human child. We'll come to that in a little bit. But the point is that the same system can be queried to answer an endless array of questions, just like your mind. And that's using the tools of this probabilistic simulation program. Okay. Now, what about on the intuitive psychology side? So here, um, we're building on tools that are very familiar to everybody in this room. In fact, many of you helped to develop them rigidly. Um, it's the basic idea that, again, is grounded in uh, early developmental psychology of what's sometimes called the principle of efficiency or has been developed or, or principle of least effort or has been developed uh, recently by several developmental psychologists that I work with, Julian Hara Edinger and Laura Schultz and others and Hyo Guan um, in what we call the naive utility calculus. But the basic idea that from very early, in some, with some evidence even again at, as young as three months, Babies understand that when people act in the world, especially when they reach for things or move around in space, they're trying to act efficiently. They're trying to, in some sense, maximize an expected utility function that takes into account the rewards of getting their goal and the costs of their actions. And that basic cost-benefit calculus can be, that, if that's effectively the the uh, metric for a planning function, and then that provides the basis for inverting the plan to observe actions and work backwards to infer an agent's beliefs and desires. And in a number of studies going back 10 years or so in our lab, we've basically taken the idea of, you know, taken state-of-the-art robotics tools or, or AI tools for probabilistic planning, embedding them in a Bayesian framework, which the tools of probabilistic programming let us do and make formal. And then that becomes models of action understanding as we work backwards to make Bayesian inferences about the beliefs and desires that explain actions. I'll just show you two examples of that, um, two of the, the nicer recent examples. So one is from some work that Chris Baker and Julian did 
together with me and, uh, and uh, Rebecca Sachs, this is what we call the, the food truck scenario. But it's just one scenario in what we studied in, in a paper that was called Bayesian Theory of Mind, where we're basically taking a POMDP, a partially observable Markov decision process, as the model of planning, and then saying, okay, well, if we assume that we're seeing an agent solving one of those POMDPs, can we work backwards to infer their reward function as well as their initial belief distribution? But both the reward function and the beliefs are highly structured around a common sense representation of physics. So to be concrete, imagine this scene here. This is a snapshot of, let's say, your local university campus where, if it's like my university, many people often go to get their lunch from food trucks that come and park in different places on campus on different days. And you go and go to your favorite truck or somewhere else if that one's not there or closed or the line's too long and so on. Okay. So in this particular part of campus, there are three trucks that come on different days. The Korean truck, the Lebanese truck, and the Mexican truck. And there's two parking spaces, which are shown in yellow. And so you can see that on this particular day, the Korean truck is down there on the bottom left left, and the Lebanese truck is there in the upper upper right. Okay, But on different days, it could be different trucks, Mexican truck, or the spots could be empty and so on. There's also a building in the way, and our friend comes out of this building where they work, and they can only see, they only have line of sight perceptual access, so, so we know that. So they can only see, for example, the near spot. Now what do they do? Well, they walk past it, around to their side, where now they can see the Lebanese truck there, and then they turned around and go back to the Korean truck. So the question, which we ask people, I'll ask you, is which is our friend's favorite food truck? Korean, Lebanese, or Mexican? You guys tell me. Very good, Mexican. Okay, so that, that is, how interesting is that, right? Uh, I think it's, it's, it's very, it's very simple, but it's very interesting because the Mexican truck isn't in here at all. It's not like, I mean, if you see me, you know, reaching for a cup of water, of course, you might think, well, I just want a cup of water. But here, what you see is our, our person following an efficient path, not to something in the world, but to something which we understand they are mentally representing. They have a false belief, or at least a false ex hope, that they thought that the Mexican truck might be there, but then it turned out that it wasn't. Right? So that's the kind of judgment we get. We have people make graded judgments about their preference for the different trucks, and for Mexican is the, is the most preferred one, and Korean second. And then they also prefer, or they also infer that mo most likely the, the agent thought that the Mexican truck was going to be there, otherwise it wouldn't have been worthwhile it would not have been efficient to go there. If you were sure the Mexican truck wasn't there, since Lebanese is your least favorite, the efficient thing would have been to just go straight to the Korean truck. Okay. And that kind of, that, that pattern of inference we can study in this experiment across really dozens of these different scenarios. I'm just showing you four here. And the same model explains all of them. Again, it doesn't require any training. There's just a couple of parameters basically calibrating the costs and rewards. And it provides a very quantitative fit, even, even more accurate than the intuitive physics models. I'll show you just one more thing that's just in progress where we're applying the same kind of idea more in a, you know, call it a grounded robotics AI setting where we're watching a person now um, with video, we have both video and connect, reach for one of a number of different objects. In this case, I'll show you a video in slow motion where she's reaching for one of 16 objects in a four by four grid and you have to decide which one she's reaching for. Okay, so just, I'll just say raise your hand. It's gonna play in slow motion. Raise your hand when you think you know which of those four by four objects she's reaching for. Uh, okay, there's all the hands went up. All right, so yeah, the, you, you saw there was an initial wave of confidence, some people weren't sure, and then all, everybody's hand went up. Okay, so roughly like that dashed black line there. Now that's not data from our uh, experiment, that's the predictions of our model. How does that work? Well, we have a causal generative model which is based on the Mujoko physics engine, which again, many of you know and use, but this is a, a physics engine designed for multi-jointed, even whole body humanoid motion planning and object manipulation, okay? And it's very natural in that, in, with that tool to express um, in the forward causal direction, the most efficient path towards any of these targets. So then we can turn this, we can embed this in a Bayesian framework for inference by just considering all the different hypotheses and seeing which one is best fits the data. So the bars there show you the Bayesian posterior, which is exactly what you saw uh, as the basis for those dashed lines. Now, if all we were doing was reaching for objects on the tabletop in front of us, of course, you know, there might be simpler ways to do that using just low-level motion cues. But consider all these other kinds of activities. Like, for example, if somebody starts from a sitting position, you might see that you can figure out a lot about what they're reaching for before they even start to move their hand or their arm just by how they move their body or torso. Or consider this guy over on the right there. That's Tao, one of the collaborators here. 
Um, you, you, you know, you'll see him doing a rather weird thing. He's, maybe you can see what he's reaching over. Um, if, you, uh, if you can't tell what he's reaching over, you know he's reaching over something. And, but still, you can figure out that there's some weird constraint, but you can figure out what his goal is even before he gets to it. Okay. And the same model can explain those things because they're all about physically efficient action with your whole body subject to the constraints of the visible constraint of the table or maybe the invisible, that's a glass plate. Okay. No computer vision system, if we're just trying to do a bottom-up vision system, is going to detect that glass plate because it's literally invisible. <laughs> but yet you still know it's there as part of understanding his action. Or consider scenes like these, which are now multi-agent systems, right? What makes the scene in the upper left look like somebody's helping somebody else, right? You have to figure out the first person's goal and the help. Or the scene in the lower right look like not helping, but maybe the opposite. So the way we try to capture that, and I don't have time to show you the details, but we've, we've captured this actually with some developmental psychologists. We've instantiated these models in ways that we've tested with adults and also with, with babies. And the basic idea is to use a kind of recursive utility calculus. Again, this is very standard in game theory and some of the multi-agent things, actually some of the work that Peter Stone has done, for example, um, where you have utility functions that depend on both agents or where, for example, one agent represents their utility to be a function of another agent. Utility, right? If I have, if my, if I take your expected utility as a positive component in mine, that's almost the definition of what it means to be helpful. If I take it to be a negative component, it's sort of a negative. It's a help, uh, hindering, right? Think about the way we talk about the golden rule or analogous kinds of principles of what it is to be a good actor in a multi-agent setting. This is a way to implement it directly. And we think that, we have even some preliminary evidence that even young babies are doing calculations like that when they watch, um, when they, watch, when they watch agents move around in the world. I'll just show you two examples of baby experiments. So this is a baby intuitive physics experiment that we did with Erno Teglis and Luca Bonatti. Actually, they did the experiment. They did almost all of the hard work. But Ed Vool and I uh, built a model which basically took the same kind of probabilistic physics engine model and showed how it could, how it could capture infants' graded expectations about which object would appear when in a range of different scenarios here. And I, I won't tell you the details other than just to say the basic kind of method is the same one that's used by Spelke and many others in the infant literature to get a sense of what do infants know. Well, you show them things that should be more or less surprising, right? You violate, you try to violate their expectations. And if, if you violate their expectations, they look longer. And what this study showed was that you could turn that into a graded signal, that infants were more likely to look or looked, looked longer the more surprised they were, where surprise we could predict based on basically the inverse of probability in a probabilistic physics engine. And we vary a number of different factors of space and time and number and, and shape attribute to make a range of predictions there. Or on the intuitive psychology side, I'm going to turn up the sound a little bit here and hope you'll be able to hear it because it kind of helps. Um, we're looking at how infants use the same kind of cost-benefit calculus to infer how much an agent values a goal. This is work that was recently done by Sherry Liu and Liz Spelke, but also with Tomer Ullman um, in, in joint Harvard-MIT project. So let's see, you may not be able to hear it. It, doesn't, it shouldn't matter too much, but um, what, you, what you see here is an agent who is faced with a costly choice and declines it, and then faced with a, another equally costly choice and accepts it, in a sense, to get to a goal. So we might say, okay, well clearly the red guy likes the yellow guy more because he chose to go to the yellow guy and not to the blue guy. But this is a much more controlled experiment. I'm just showing you two of the videos. Across the experiment, infants see the agent makes the same number of moves towards the yellow and to the blue, but some are higher cost than others, okay? And by varying cost, and here cost is really physical work done. It, um, it's important that this builds on the kind of intuitive physics, these are 10 month olds that we already know 10 month olds are sensitive to. So the cost, the physical work done might be how high do you jump over a wall or a ramp that you have to roll up that could be steeper or less steep or it could be a gap of different sizes that you have to jump across. And in each of these cases, infants take the cost that an agent is willing to pay to get to a goal as a sign of how much they value that goal. Okay. Now it's notable and, and I'll come back to this in a little bit, but it's notable that in, in these and many other infant experiments, notice how different they are from real world imagery. They're cartoons, basically, right? And I think that's important if you want to think about, say, learning these things based on um, you know, some kind of system that's trained on the, just you know, end to end from scratch on the infant's real world visual experience. It, it's, I think it's pretty clear from looking at how infants deal with these abstract stimuli that 
there's something very abstract and conceptual in the way they understand intuitive physics and others' actions, intuitive psychology, costs and benefits, even from the beginning. So that's going to turn us now to the second part of the talk, which is you know, where does learning actually come into the picture? If we can see some versions of these abilities in young children, how do they get there? Okay. So one answer, what I just alluded to, is that you know, somehow these systems emerge, mostly from scratch in each baby by learning in some end-to-end -end way from raw pixels what is needed to support prediction and interaction with the world. Okay. Now, this isn't a crazy idea. I, th I don't think it's the right one, but some of the smartest people in our field have suggested it and worked on it. So one of the earliest versions of this was some work that Ilya Sutskevir and Jeff Hinton did a little bit before the deep learning became officially the thing. Um, but in their work on recurrent temporal restricted Boltz machines, um, they uh, tried to basically learn the physics of bouncing balls from scratch. Or in some very nice recent work from Facebook AI led by Adam Lehrer and Rob Fergus and others, um, they took some, you know, very much the same kind of block tower tasks that we've studied and trained a, you know, basically a deep convnet with a little bit of extra stuff, but not too much more, to predict will the, will the blocks fall over and something about you know, uh, the, the pixel flow um, to get more supervisory signals. On some very interesting recent work from DeepMind, um, and there's a number of papers in DeepMind that, that embody this philosophy, and in some sense, much of, the, much of DeepMind's philosophy of AGI is really summed up by this, this view. Um, but in some very nice recent work that's explicitly inspired by the same kind of science that I've been talking about, um, Matt Botvinnik's group has looked at infant intuitive physics um, and, and you know, generated some uh, training and testing data sets that are sort of cartoon versions of the same thing, um, as well as some uh, what, uh, similar kinds of theory of mind displays. Um, and again, I think all of these things are very interesting. The machine theory of mind, which was presented at this conference, um, I think is especially interesting and, and syn synergistically connects with some of the work that, that I was just talking about um, in ways that I'm happy to talk about afterwards or in questions. Okay? Um, but, but still, I think that the basic idea which you see in all of these approaches, which is you're trying to learn in an end-to-end -end way something like the intuitive physics or intuitive psychology representations I'm talking about based on just trying to predict what's going to happen over some time scales in space, I don't think that's consistent with the, the data that we have from infants, and I think it's, it's, uh, there's a long way to show that this is actually going to work, even if it's not the way infants do it. It's a long way to show that this is actually going to build something as generally useful as these systems already are in infants. And here I come back to the cartoon versus real thing, right? So in, you know, in these sorts of displays, um, they are tested on cartoon kinds of displays, or they're, they're, you know, they're, they're trained on, on and tested on the same kinds of displays. You know, cartoon grid worlds are very simple cartoon physics displays. Um, and they show, you know, again, impressively that they can generalize to other instances that were not exactly like those, or even somewhat different than those in the training set. But the general, generalization is not huge, and it's not to anything like the full range of images real um, or synthetic that even young babies can see these things going on in even before they've had really almost any training experience. So I think it's just fundamentally different what these systems are trying to do and what infants are trying to do. Okay. So the approach to learning that we've been uh, pursuing is there's a few different directions and I'll just try to summarize them quickly. But you know, they're basically, some of these are learning with or in this game engine in the head and others, which I think are the, the biggest and hardest problems, so hard that you know, nobody has a good solution at this point, is how do you actually learn something like the game engine itself. So let's talk about, for example, learning to use the game engine in the head. Because I think this is the clearest place where in the research program that we're developing, the tools of neural networks and deep learning are clearly valuable and clearly a, a good way to go. And what we're talking about here is pattern recognition, but the patterns are patterns of conditional inference. So this often goes by the name of amortized inference or inference compilation, for example. Noah Goodman, Frank Wood, a number of others have developed this kind of idea, um, at least in, in, you know, in, the, in the probabilistic programming community, but well beyond people who say they're doing probabilistic programming, there's versions of this idea. Okay, um, and it's, I, this is an ideal thing to do when you want to make inferences that go against the direction of causality, when you want to invert causal arrows, basically. Um, so you want to, say, invert graphics engines, in other words, do what we call vision. And you have lots of experience, okay, um, and you have lots of opportunity to um, 
to, to uh, train a system essentially to do this, okay? And it's really important to get it right, so you might even dedicate some brain circuitry to it. So th that's the kind of thing we've been doing, for example, in vision, and I'll just show you a little bit here about some work that, again, I started doing together with Vikash Mansinga, Tejas Kulkarni, um, who's been developing some very interesting kind of analogous ideas, actually, that he also presented at uh, ICML. Um, and, uh, and push me Kohli, and I'm just sort of highlighting two students who've been leading the main efforts that I'm talking about here today, Zhang Jin Wu and uh, uh, Jun Yan Zhu. Okay, so the basic idea is to take the graphics pipeline, for example, how scenes are structured with objects and how that gives rise to images via important intermediate representations, like for example, a z-buffer, something like the, the depth to the nearest visible surface, or analogous kinds of representations of surface normals that help you do some real-time shading. And to turn those around and to say, well, maybe we can train an inverse graphics engine, in other words, a vision network, okay? And the key idea here is to exploit the generative model in a couple of ways. Sometimes I say this is like uh, Judea Pearl meets Jeff Hinton meets David Marr. Um, Hopefully some of you know, know what I'm talking about with all three of those folks. Um, but, the, but the generative model, both in sort of, like Hinton's wake sleep algorithm, the generative model uh, provides the training data for the recognition model. So you might not need any actual re real world labeled images. But also the conditional independent structure of the generative model, if you exploit that in the recognition model, it allows you to learn recognition networks or vision networks which are, can be learned much more efficiently, which are much more robust and much more generalizable. Okay. So here's a way we've been doing this in something that we call MarNet, um, again, in honor of, of Mar, for the specific problem of 3D object reconstruction. So a number of people in computer vision are working on this, and you know, our approach is, is good in some ways, but it's, it's, it has a lot in common with other approaches out there, which I don't have time in this talk to tell you about, um, but feel free to ask about that. Um, but the basic problem that we and others are trying to do here is to take a 2D image of an object, something like an ImageNet type image, um, where there's basically one object in the center of view, and then we want to reconstruct a dense, accurate 3D model, something like um, a voxel grid reconstruction of the full 3D shape, or it could be we could use point clouds or meshes, and the community is actively exploring different kinds of representations. The key thing here, we happen to be using voxel representations, but the key thing in this work is the intermediate representation, the idea of these 2.5D representations, like what Mar called a 2.5D sketch, or what's also sometimes known as intrinsic images. Again, it's something like an image-based map of depth or surface normals or silhouettes, or we might also talk about albedo or the object reflectance, okay, which is a natural representation in the graphics direction. The conditional independence is it's the variable that renders the 2D image and the 3D shape conditionally independent, right? It, to a first approximation, at least, the, something like the depth and surface normals map contains all the information about 3D shape that's in the image and screens off all the other stuff that, is, that makes the image interesting to look at and realistic but not actually uh, causally relevant to the inverse shape problem. Okay. So we implement that idea in a neural network, which is explicitly trained to go through these several stages. Okay. It has training losses for the intrinsic images, like the surface normal map. Okay. And then it has a sort of a 2D and a 3D convolutional structure, and it's trained to produce a 3D voxel reconstruction. Okay. Um, there's, by, by, uh, by setting things up in this way, you can actually train this network completely from synthetic or imagined data from the generative model. Um, you, you, you have to start off with a bunch of 3D shape models, like, th like for example, chairs or other objects, and then you imagine them in different positions against different backgrounds, okay? But that provides training data for multiple layers of this network. And again, we also can use the graphics online in perception for what's known as reprojection consistency. Again, a number of groups have used this idea, and we're developing that here, too, which helps basically fine-tune small differences, or fine-tune the 3D shape interpretation to really fit the actual surface normals. And because we know the causal structure of how 3D goes to 2D via 2.5D, and we know we only have to go back to 2.5D, then that's a powerful assumption and makes this work efficiently. And, and it, you know, this method can provide surprisingly good 3D reconstructions for objects in a familiar class like chairs. Okay. Um, now, we can extend this idea also to full scenes, and Jajan, together with uh, Pushmi Kohli, built something which they call the uh, neural scene renderer. Um, 
This was a CVPR paper from last year. Um, and th they use this to de render into various graphics engines. It's like, you can think of it as like a generalized autoencoder, where the decoder is actually a game graphics engine. Okay? And now we can apply that same idea to the graphics physics engine combination of, let's say, our blocks world scenes. Okay? So here, the key is that the input to the graphics engine is the same as the input and output of the physics engine. It's this three-dimensional you know, object model. Okay? And that's really important. Okay. So the system here learns to see the blocks, learns to see where they are, their size, shape, and color, and then that provides very fast ability to actually see the scene, and then we can, then we can make inferences about what's going to happen next, and even imagine what's going to happen next, by using our actual symbolic physics engine. So it's a kind of neuro-symbolic hybrid. Here I'm showing you on some of the scenes from the Facebook AI group, they took real movies, you'll see the real frames on the left, and, and you're going to see in a second those, those movies, what happens when these blocks, when, when we turn them on and the blocks fall. And then I'm going to show you on the right a resynthesized movie showing what our system predicts is likely to happen. Okay. But our system just sees the first frame, then it de-renders into the, the state of the game physics engine, and then it makes a guess by running forward the, the game physics engine. So here we go. Um, I'll show that to you again. You can see that you know, our, our prediction is not exactly right. Um, but it's, it's right enough. Again, at the level of intuitive physics, it's about right, right? Maybe the thing falls a little bit too soon. Maybe it doesn't fall in exactly the right direction. But basically, the right blocks fall in basically the right direction. I don't think people can predict any better. And that's the kind of thing we're testing experimentally. And you may not need to predict any better for most purposes that matter. Um, and again, this is a challenge and an interesting constraint for robotics. Here's a few more movies, just so you can see that. You know, here's, and here's one more. Just think for yourself, like, okay, what do I think is going to happen? Okay, now I'll show you what our system thinks is going to happen. All right. So again, I think this is a nice combination of pattern recognition where, where, it's, where it's tractable on the vision side with a model-based approach for the physics. And the, having that physics model in there with real forces, we can actually use it for planning. So if I want to, say, on that scene there, pick up only the green block or keep the blocks from planning, or from falling, then the system tells me where I can apply forces in 3D, although I'm showing you here in 2D. So the lesson on this idea of learning to see, in a sense, right, is that thinking about the conditional independence structure of probabilistic generative programs gives us really useful guidance on how to integrate neural nets into the toolkit, right? It tells us when and where to use neural nets when we're inverting causality. It tells us what training targets to use, namely the simulator state for our dynamics model. It gives us key intermediate representations, the bottleneck representations in the simulator on the graphic side, such as the 2.5D sketch. And it also you know, tells us how to come up with training data, um, which, is, which we can generate just from within our head. Now, we can also talk about learning actual resources in the game engine, like learning the objects. So again, in some nice work that Zhang Jin Wu did together with Chen Kai Zhang and others at NIPS uh, two years ago, uh, they built a 3D GAN. This is one of many such things at this point, right? But just basically trying to say, okay, well, let's say I want to build a generative model of objects at the voxel level. We can do that, okay? If we know about objects. You have to know about objects and you have to know about 3D, okay? We can use that as a prior. This is a paper that was just accepted to be presented at the next ECCV, which shows that by incorporating that basically into MarNet, you can get even better 3D reconstructions for a wide range of, or a somewhat wide range of different image categories, chairs, airplanes, cars, and so on. Still far from perfect, but it helps, okay? Some really cool recent work that Jun Yan did together with Jajin and a number of others is to kind of extend this approach to include a full shape texture generative model which can actually produce realistic looking images. So here you take a 3D GAN, the same kind of one we had before, and now you have the, the generative pipeline, 3D, 2.5D, 2D, and you build also a texture model. It's also an adversarially trained generative texture model. But the key is you're using your knowledge of 2D and 2.5D and 3D. So the texture is something which is basically mapped onto the 2.5D sketches in order to produce, for example, a realistic shape as well as a realistic um, image of a car. And compared to other GAN results, which again are really quite exciting and, and, and impressive, um, and I'm certainly impressed with them along with many others, but here we can take a step to make much more realistic kinds of um, generative models for objects because we're modeling both the 3D and the 2D structure jointly. And the representation is disentangled. It explicitly separates out the shape, the pose, the texture, or texture and color, and those can be independently manipulated. So again, it's another nice hybrid of 
using neural networks for what they're good at in pattern recognition, but thinking about the symbolic compositional causal structure of objects in a three-dimensional world. Okay. It's also not nearly enough. So um, in work that I've been working on pretty much for my whole career, it's not really the focus of this talk because I think a lot of people know it. Certainly the work that Brendan Lake did on the Omniglot data set with Russ Salakudinov and I, it was in science. It got quite a lot of attention. Many people here have used this data set and there's, you know, there's, there's quite, I think the machine learning community knows what we're up to here, so I don't need to tell you guys about it. Uh, but this is part of a long-term research program that for me goes back to my PhD thesis in trying to understand how human children can learn new concepts including new words, um, but new concepts for object classes from just one example. So like our CAM example, if you've never seen a CAM piece of rock climbing equipment, one example is enough to pick out the others. And here we tried to tackle a simple small step to that in Brendan's work with these handwritten characters in many different languages, each of which, right, you can see is its own thing. It's its, it's, its own simple visual class that you can learn from one example. You don't need thousands of examples like an MNIST, okay? Um, and the Bayesian program learning model that we introduced tried to use the tools of probabilistic programs to tackle that problem. So basically what, what the, the BPL model for the Omniglot data set consists of is a, a multi-stage probabilistic action or drawing program, right, which captures the strokes and substrokes and their relations that people use to actually draw characters, okay? And then by inverting that in a Bayesian fashion, we can infer from a single example the action program sufficient to act to again generate convincing new examples that even pass a kind of Turing test. So if you haven't seen this before, you might think this is a little bit cool. I, I always think this is cool because I always forget which one are the humans and the machines. So here's the Turing test. Um, given one example, we can ask our, our algorithm and also nine people to make up an instance uh, or a new instance of this character, not to copy it, but to just you know, draw another one. And here I'm, com I'm contrasting the humans and the machines. It's different in each case, but see if you can figure out which ones are the machines. It's not easy. Think about it for a second. Maybe, maybe, maybe somebody will get it right. Uh, okay, I'll show you the answer now. So those are the machine. Um, raise your hand if you got them all right. In this big room, somebody should get them all right. But probably about one in two to the sixth of you got it all right. Um, most people get about three out of six because most people are at chance, all right? Now, this is just one simple small example, one baby step, right? But in recent work and ongoing work, we and a number of others are trying to take the same approach to many other domains of one-shot learning, for example, in speech or gesture or other kinds of more realistic objects. Um, some steps that we're excited about, Kevin Ellis, who's um, a PhD student in our group together with Daniel Ritchie, a professor at Brown, have used similar kinds of ideas, also enabled by a kind of neural network visual front end, to try to learn graphics drawing programs for hand-drawn diagrams, also from one example, and to capture the abstractions in them and to generalize. Um, there's an archive paper on that, but it's also submitted. Um, or recently, Yang Long Tian and Zhang Jianhu and others have taken a similar approach to learning very simple kinds of shape programs for 3D things. But, this, you know, brings me to the very last topic because I think of all of these here as really just warm-ups for the most interesting hard problem, which is how do you actually learn the full common sense simulator of the world? How do we learn the game engine itself? In other words, could we build a program learning program? Could we build a program which takes the kind of experiences that you might have as a young baby or over evolutionary time, because if much of this knowledge is built in through evolution, then in some sense these program learning programs might have to be more like evolutionary programs. But can we somehow build a program that constructs from experience a physics engine, for example? And if we want to think of it developmentally, could we say, think about what's going on in the mind of a baby who over the first year of their life um, reliably goes through certain stages. Here I'm pointing to the work of Rene Bayer-Jean, but also Spelke, who I've mentioned a few times, and many others in infant research have mapped out with um, very clever experiments, and admittedly, not a whole lot of data, because it's very hard to come by infant data, so there are big error bars on these numbers. You, if, if you're taking a picture of the slide, that's great, but just note, take everything with a big grain of error bar salt. Um, but, you know, we, we do know something about how infants' intuitive physics uh, develops, let's say, over the first year. And so we might ask, can we capture these different stages of knowledge with different kinds of probabilistic physics programs? And then can we capture the transitions between them with some kind of program learning program? Okay. Now, this is a very hard problem. We, we joke about it as the hard problem of learning because it's much harder than, say, deep learning. Um, 
still deep, but hard. Because if you're talking about search in the space of programs, there isn't anything like a nice, smooth optimization landscape, right, where you can just use stochastic gradient descent. Rather, it's a, you know, there's no nice, simple topology or geometry, and rarely any way to compute gradients in, in the space of all possible programs. Okay. So how do we solve this problem? Well, there's a couple of approaches, right? One approach is to try to turn it into you know, more of a differentiable programming problem, turn it into the kind of thing that you could use, for example, gradient descent by trying to represent your physics engine in neural network terms. So that was effectively what was going on in this slide I showed you before, right? Um, and as I alluded to, it, it, it sort of works, but it doesn't really work. It doesn't, you know, you can train on images of three balls bouncing around in a box, and you kind of get a model that sort of captures three balls bouncing in a box. It doesn't generalize um, to four balls or five balls or ten balls or boxes that are shaped differently, let alone all the rest of intuitive physics. Now, there's been some really exciting recent developments along this direction. Uh, a little bit from our group, so Michael Chang, who was an undergrad at MIT, he's now a PhD student at Berkeley, he built something called the Neural Physics Engine, but a lot of other work, especially coming out of Pete Battaglia's group at DeepMind, on various kinds of graph-based networks, such as interaction networks and relation networks. Um, but what, what all these things have in common is a, an interesting neurosymbolic hybrid. They're all trying to learn physics engines, but, they're tr but, they, but they put into the system, it's pre-programmed knowledge, that the world has objects, okay, and the objects, they have object permanence, the objects have properties like mass, they have location, and there are events, like when two objects might, might interact with each other. So there are relations and at least sometimes even events, okay. But then they, they learn, using distributed representations and neural networks, they learn something about the laws of how forces work. So sort of trying to learn, you could say it's kind of like learning F equals MA and something like the particular forces in play. It could be gravity or forces of collision. And what these systems are able to do is to, is to generalize in much more significant ways. So they can generalize to many different numbers of objects and to different kinds of object configurations, all right? And I think that's a nice case study that shows the power of having, putting in the right kinds of symbolic knowledge about objects and events that seem to be in infants' minds from the very beginning and then trying to learn the rest. I think it's still an open question I'm one that I'm somewhat skeptical of, but totally open to, and you know, people in many groups are working on this. But it's an open question whether this can scale up to learn abstract physics that generalize in much more substantial ways as even infants do. And I think you know, another approach is kind of coming from the opposite direction, is just to just bite the bullet and say, we're just gonna learn that game engine <laughs> um, by programming. So you can, you can say, well, just why don't we learn a game engine the way programmers um, write a game engine or write a game. You might be saying, I, mostly I, I could start with the game engine, I just have to learn the game of my life, right? Now that's really hard. But the idea that learning might be like programming, I think this is one of the most important, exciting frontier areas. And this is the sort of direction I wanna leave you with. Um, it's the one direction that I'm personally most excited about in learning. I think it's very hard, but I think it sort of has to be right. So think about as when you write programs or when you code, think about all the ways you try to fulfill the goal of coding. What is the goal of coding? It's making your code more awesome. It could be more accurate, but it could also be faster or more elegant or more reusable or explainable or any number of things, okay? Um, but think about all the activities that advance that goal. Sometimes making it more accurate or faster is tuning parameters, okay? Sometimes a compiler does that for you automatically, sometimes you do it by hand, sometimes you use gradient descent, okay? But think about all the other ways that you make your code more awesome. You extend or refine existing functions. You write whole new functions. You borrow functions from other people. You borrow a whole library of functions. You write your own library of functions. You maybe write a whole new language, okay? All of those activities of coding have analogs in children's learning. And I think that if we really want an adequate reverse engineering account, a computational account of how children learn, we're going to need to capture all of these in machine forms. And that means algorithms that write algorithms. Now, um, you're all lucky if you're interested in this, because you could go to the NumPy workshop on Sunday which stands for Neural Abstract Machines and Program Induction, which is a gathering of, of one of the places, this is the second one of those, the first one was at NIPS two years ago, where people who are bringing together machine learning and programming languages techniques, as well as other ideas from cognitive science and AI, um, are, are really working on this hard problem. I'll just preview one of the papers that Kevin Ellis, who I already mentioned, is going to present there. This is joint work with Armando Solar Lazama, who will also give a talk there, on what we call Dream Coder, which is a, it's a kind of a wake sleep algorithm for learning to write code. It's a system which kind of inspired by the way humans consolidate their knowledge in sleep, 
learns to write new functions and indeed whole new libraries of functions. It bootstraps domain-specific libraries with a wake phase where it tries to solve problems and two kinds of sleep phases. One in which you consolidate out abstractions. Basically, you, you make your language more rich that, that then allows you to express new functions in a more compact way. But there's also a, a neural network that helps things, that helps guide the search. And that can also be trained in a sleep phase, much like the Helmholtz machine, the original wake-sleep algorithm. So just to wrap up then, I've tried to give you a window into a research program that is somewhere far along, but really just in its early stages, asking how can we capture the basics of human common sense, our understanding of the world in terms of physical objects, intentional agents, and their interactions that we see in, from the youngest infants, how can we capture that in engineering terms? What's the content of this knowledge? How is it used? And how is it built? And I've shown you how some of these new tools from probabilistic programs, game engines, along with uh, just these hints about program synthesis and program induction uh, are starting to be able to tackle these problems. But very clearly, we're just at the beginning of this challenge. And you know, it's just an ex a super exciting time that we're able to maybe tackle AI's greatest dream, the idea of being able to build a machine that starts like a baby and learns like a child. And I'll leave you with what might be a roadmap, how we, we can you know, address the most basic questions, which is what is the inductive bias? How do we start? And how do we learn? How do we capture the ways in which it's not just a blank slate, and it's not just reinforcement learning or gradient descent using these tools that I've talked about? And just, just I want to just leave you with a couple of thought points um, for, that, that challenge some of our conventional machine learning or AI wisdom. When we look at human learning mechanisms, we see these mechanisms, which are really mechanisms that help us revise and construct inductive bias. They don't just work within an existing inductive bias when we're learning with programs. So this way we can, this is a way we can benefit from strong starting conditions, just like all other species, and yet be able to revise these inductive biases, make them flexible. In other words, inborn or present from birth doesn't mean inflexible. Okay, so we should think about that and not just assume that hard coding something or hand coding something means that it can't be recoded. Also, think about if, if much of learning is something that happens through evolution, then that's a very different process from gradient descent, and AI researchers might want to uh, gain something from that, thinking that way. And finally, if we think about real learning in the sense of the learning that happens in a child's mind, it might be much more like thinking or programming than like gradient descent. But that's okay because um, if you like gradient descent, because gradient descent is highly synergistic, right? Learning programs could actually be tractable in ways similar to end-to-end -end learning of, of differentiable programs or neural networks, and neural networks might even help to make that tractable. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joss, for these very inspiring talks. So we have time for a few questions. So if you want to ask a question, go to the mic and raise your hand. OK, Tom? Hi, hey Josh. A wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Are there things in the infant data that you cannot explain with the combination of probabilistic programming and a game engine? That's a great question. And I think it's hard to say because we and others have barely tried, right? Um, I think that um, I think there's going to be some things. I mean, if by probabilistic programming you also include neural networks, I think there's. I mean, I, I think there's that, that's important because you have to you have to handle whatever are the learned visual procedures, right? Uh -huh. But it, you know, it's it's quite possible that there will be. Th in, in fact, quite likely that there are things that have to do with cognitive resource limitations, like just visual working memory, which is similar but more limited in infants. And another thing that you see when you look into the infant literature is that um, infants in many ways are like adults, but slower. You can see this in neurophysiology, actually, and you can see this in behavior. And apparently, it might even be true for infant monkeys. So it, so it's, it might be that some of the things that infants seem to not do have to do with just slower processing speeds that um, have more of a hardware explanation and not so much of a, of a learning explanation. Thanks. So, Someone okay, over here. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you so much. It was a very interesting talk. I was just wondering, like, you could imagine that as a deep learning person, I could accept your premise of innateness that, you know, gradient descent isn't going on within a lifetime. Yeah. But we have methods like deep meta learning where we could imagine that uh, gradient descent is going on between lifetimes. And so basically the idea is like, okay, if I accept innateness, I don't yeah. necessarily have to change anything about my methodological, you know, day-to-day -day 
AI practitioner stuff, why should I not only accept innateness, but then also hop over to this more structured approach? Yeah, no, that's a reasonable question, and I'm glad that some people are pursuing that, and I'm also open to pursuing that. But the main, the main thing to think about there, right, is think about the difference between what we know, at least, to be the algorithms of evolution versus the algorithms of gradient descent, right? I mean, they, there's some similarities. You could talk about a fitness landscape, but even there, it's very complicated because in real evolution, things are changing, you know, multi, it's a, it's a multi-agent and multi-species world. But also, I think the main thing is that, that evolution in the sense of like, you know, constructing genetic programs that then unfold in development to build brains, right, and bodies, that is, that, that is doing something like program induction. It is doing discrete search through a big space of programs, developmental programs. We don't know that much about how those programs work, but that, that is our best way to understand it. And, you know, it, it, in some sense, it has many of the characters that, characteristics that you might not want in a learning algorithm. <laughs> it's slow, it, ha it has to be massively parallel on a level that even DeepMind or OpenAI are, are still not ready to grapple with. And you, you're going to have lots of false starts. You can't guarantee how it's going to come out. It might not be repeatable, right? So it might be that we're going to have to consider, even if you want to you know, build learning algorithms that, that, that meta-learn what evolution learned, that they're going to have to have something more like the character of evolutionary search or evolutionary computation. So whether it's genetic algorithms or, or genetic programming, I think, and again, I'm far from alone in thinking this, that the techniques of genetic programming um, which were also popular around the same time that neural networks were popular, their last wave, the late 80s and early 90s, they're also poised for revival. And the only reason that we haven't seen a revival of those techniques on the scale that we've seen neural networks is that they were going to require orders of magnitude more computing power to pay off, and we're still waiting for that. We're still waiting for the GPUs, and we're still waiting for the AlexNet equivalent of that. So I, I would put my um, money and time on that direction in addition to uh, the direction you were talking about. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the talk. The, the question is, um, uh, how can you reconcile the fact that uh, you, you describe the, um, the progress of learning like in the Piaget sequence where you build skills, more elaborate skills, on the top of simpler skills? And what we can see in other, uh, say, realms is the fact that the progress is made by pruning. You have something which is uh, a big space, and then you manage to find something, and then the next progress is yeah. by removing details and removing everything you can, right, and simplifying this. That's a great question. I'm not sure why you think I characterized learning in Piagetian terms. I never said that, and I, 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 I actually said the opposite, in the sense that Piaget thought of object permanence as a learned skill, whereas I cited Spelke for talking about how it might be innate. But I mean, I think it is true that when AI researchers talk about development, they usually talk, they're usually, if they're talking about science at all, they're talking about Piaget, which is great. Piaget was very inspiring, but that's kind of like talking about Turing, right? I mean, Piaget is that old. And he was the brilliant founder of the field, much like Turing. He lived a lot longer and got to write a lot more and do a lot more. But, you know, I'm looking to much more recent research in infant cognitive development and children's learning that paints a different picture, including one that I think is consistent with what you're talking about. The, I, you know, I think that is certain, that's one way. There are many ways to write code. If you think about these activities, right, some of them look like pruning. Some of them look constructivist. Some of them look like, you know, writing sort of abstract code and then filling in the details. So it's, I certainly don't think that children's learning always proceeds from concrete to abstract. In fact, often the evidence is that it goes in the opposite direction, right? Maybe because the abstractions are, are wired in, as somebody, some people have suggested in language, or maybe because actually what we've called in some of our work the blessing of abstraction, that actually sometimes the abstract stuff is, is the easiest and first thing to figure out, and then you fill in the details. Again, much like a human coder who figures out maybe the high-level abstract structure of their program before they actually uh, write the specifics, and you know, often good code is written that way, starting from the abstractions and, and the high-level structure and then filling in the details. Last question from the right. Thank you. So this idea of using game engine for data augmentation to be used for, to generate label training data for learning system is great. And it works while we are in the gaming engine and also physics. But however, when we bring the psychology in, yeah. it means that there are subjective differences person-specific differences that cannot be modeled by noise or just considered as a, as a 
upper bound of the noise is actually inherent differences based on the theory of mind even you mentioned. Yes. So yep. how do you incorporate now, that's that? A that's a great question. L let me just first clarify that what I'm talking about is similar to, very similar to, what a lot of people do, which is using a game engine for data augmentation. But I'm, but I'm suggesting something a little bit different than that. I'm suggesting that might be where all the data comes from. <laughs> um, but you're right to point to the difference between um, the graphics and physics part is much easier. Um, in part because like that's just been the way it's always, you know, the graphics and physics are evolutionarily ancient because they're, they're physically ancient in the world. Um, but it's important here that, you know, the phase that I'm talking about when I talk, especially when I talk about learning with the game engine, is really from zero months up to about 18 months, okay? And it's important that this, the, or, or you know, the intuitive psychology of 18 month olds is limited, right? It's not the full theory of mind. Okay, it, there's some evidence that 18 month olds can represent false beliefs, but only when those false beliefs are about like where an object is in space. So I think, I mean, I only gestured at this here, but I'm happy to talk more about it and we've written some things on this. I think that the tools that you do have already in game engines, in which agents have very limited abilities, very limited notions of beliefs and desires, which are really just about the space around them, the things, the objects, their locations, their relations, and beliefs, Beliefs which are formed based on perceptual access, like what I can see, and goals that are about you know, getting one object in some relation to another, th th that, you know, that to a first approximation captures a lot of at least the youngest infants, I think, intuitive psychology. Now, we, we form much richer forms of intuitive psychology, but especially once we have language, right? So you know, if, if I were to maybe just leave you with one final thought about where this goes beyond the 18-month-old stage, and here I'm again, I'm not being original, but channeling Liz Spelke and a number of others, I would say you could very roughly divide human learning into three stages. Again, it's also resonant with the last talk from Joyce, that there's sort of the zero to 18 month stage, which is everything up to the very earliest stages of language, when children are just starting to learn words and just beginning to you know, put a couple of words together. Um, that's, that's basically all you learn before language is really online in a full adult way. Then there's the next couple of years from say 18 months to age three or so, three to four, where you're, the main cognitive achievement is to learn language, right? Is to use that first stage to ground out your early semantics and syntax and pragmatics, pragmatics. And then once you get to three, basically, now you've got a, enough of a fully functioning language system that you can ask questions and learn from the answers that people give you. So you start to learn things in language. You have to ask, why did you do this? Why didn't we do this? And your theory of mind transforms and everything else transforms. And that's just the third phase of learning, which is age three up to the whole rest of your life, where you know it's really through language language that we learn most of the rest of what we learn, including a much richer intuitive psychology, as well as many other aspects of culture, morality, and so on. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so let's thanks Josh again.